tonight we're going to be speaking about John Quincy Adams and his legacy. Uh, and we're going to be speaking with the president of the society, Dr. David Hendrickson, uh, who, in addition to his role with us, is a professor emeritus at Colorado College. He's the author of several books on U.S. foreign policy, including Freedom, Independence, and Peace, John Quincy Adams and American Foreign Policy. Now, this book is available for free as a digital edition. Uh, or in print exclusively from Barnes and Noble, where it costs nine ninety nine. Uh, I was involved a lot in editing it, and I think it's a really excellent uh, work. I've dropped a link to it in the chat. Uh, but let's just uh, just to kick things off, Dr. Hendrickson, uh, to set us some context, maybe give us an outline of John Quincy Adams' life and career, so we can understand what we're working with here. Well, Adams was a totally remarkable figure in the early Republic of the United States. Uh, he went abroad at age 11 with his father, who, of course, was a uh, one of the first diplomat, uh, diplomatists of the United States, and actually succeeded in, even as a teenager, in, in acquiring some very important posts. And then he went on to a career which spanned some 60 years in American political life. Uh, he came to George Washington's notice for writing various essays in the 1790s. Washington thought, oh man, this is quite the talent. And, uh, uh, and he didn't know it when he first read Adams' essays that he was the son of Washington's vice president, John Adams. Uh, that Adams uh, was a minister abroad in the Netherlands and Prussia and Russia and England. Uh, he helped uh, uh, negotiate the Treaty of Ghent in 1815. He was Secretary of State for eight years under President James Monroe, then became president himself uh, in 1825. And after that, he did what no other American political leader or no other American president has done, which is to resume his career in the House of Representatives, where he represented Quincy, Massachusetts, until his death in 1848. Adams is very widely regarded as the most important or certainly one of the most important secretaries of state in the 19th century. He had a tremendous influence, for example, on William Seward, who was Lincoln's secretary of state and who admired Adams tremendously. So there's a sense in which he spans that entire period of the First Republic from the founding up until the Civil War. And for reasons that I'll get into later, he had a, a very great influence on Abraham Lincoln and uh, set forth doctrines that were very important to Lincoln and that Lincoln followed uh, when he was president. So Adams, I think, really thought more deeply about the purposes of the American experiment than anyone. And uh, he is a kind of seer who um, uh, is, uh, uh, you know, participates in the great accomplishments of the United States, but also feels intensely uh, the agonies and injustices of slavery and emerges as a stout fighter against slavery uh, when he's a member of the House of Representatives. So Adams is most famous for his speech on July 4th, 1821, which was while he was Secretary of State, gave a speech at the Capitol commemorating uh, the Declaration of Independence. And it's best known for the phrase that America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. So what's the context of that speech and what was his message? Well, the context was that Adams was actually applying or, or replying to uh, uh, Lexington and Edinburgh, as he put it. Uh, Lexington meaning the Kentuckian Henry Clay, who as leader of the, or speaker of the House of Representatives at that time, had urged the United States to join forces with the South American republics in opposition to Spain. And to, to Edinburgh, uh, after an article in the Edinburgh Review, which called on the United States and Great Britain to join hands together in opposition to the Holy Alliance in Europe and to promote national independence and political freedom on the European continent. And Adams was opposed to both of those enterprises. He wanted to uh, stake an entirely American ground 
and to keep the United States separate from the European system. And he warned that to adopt a different policy would involve the United States and all of the wars of interest and intrigue uh, that usurp the standard of freedom, as he put it. Uh, the end result being that our maxims would inevitably change from liberty to force. Now, that is a very prophetic speech because, in effect, it constitutes a kind of critique of the kind of role that the United States adopted in the 20th century, and uh, uh, even more so in the 21st century. And Adams warned that the, that the assumption of that role would carry with us some very dangerous consequences. Uh, in a sense, it, it, it uh, prefigures the famous farewell address of Dwight Eisenhower, who warned of the emergence of a military industrial complex. That would be antithetical to the, uh, the uh, nature of Republican institutions in the United States because it would substitute the military voice for the civil voice. And we've seen a whole range of consequences threatening to liberty that have emerged as a consequence of America's world role. We see that most especially in the rise of the surveillance state and uh, combining these. Uh, powerful new technologies that are threatening to the liberty of the citizen. We see it in the displacement of civilian authority over, over national security policy, where you know no one gets on CNN or MSNBC unless they've served in the armed forces. And uh, the, the, so Adams thought that the assumption of that kind of role would be inherently threatening to liberty. And when he said, uh, you know, we would adopt the maxims of force. He meant the maxims of the power state uh, with its affiliated doctrines that our enemies don't understand anything but force. And so therefore, we must apply that uh, uh, to the maximum. Whereas Adams believed that America could most effectively change the world by constituting a good example to it. And uh, uh, it's one of the classic statements of of American foreign policy in the in the 19th century, and it continues to have a very impressive resonance today. Yeah, maybe you know, just to give folks a little more context on the period, uh, you know, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here, but you know, the uh, at this time, uh, there you know, there were really two uh, sets of events that were very interesting to you know freedom loving Americans. Uh, one was the rise of these Latin American republics associated with Simon Bolivar, you know, the kind of collapse of the, uh, the Spanish empire in, uh, in the Americas, uh, the erosion of their power and the emergence of states that were adopting forms of government uh, that were similar to our own. And then at the same time around this period, you had the, the rebellion happening in Greece uh, against uh, against the Ottoman Empire and its power, and uh, you know you had a lot of people in America and throughout the West who were very uh, very sympathetic to that. I think it was Lord Byron who uh, went and uh, you know was involved uh, in that uh, in that conflict as well. Um, you know is that is that a fair summation of you know that these were highly sympathetic causes to the United States where we saw a lot of our own values being implicated. Yes, they were. And uh, I think one thing to uh, emphasize with respect to both of those struggles in South America, as well as in Greece, is that above all, they implicated not democracy as such, but the principle of national independence. The principle of national independence was, was a value that was held very closely by America's leaders. And Adams certainly sympathized with those quests. He looked with a certain skepticism on the ability of the South American republics to achieve free republican governments. He thought that the, uh, the incubus of um, Catholicism would weigh upon them and that uh, the principles of militarism inherited from Catholic Spain would prejudice their ability to, to establish such governments. And in that context uh, or, or in that uh, argument, his opponent was Henry Clay. Clay adopted the view that, oh no, 
the, 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 if you read the speeches of the great statesmen in South America, uh, they are great enthusiasts of the American experiment and look to North America as an example and as a guide. But that enthusiasm for South American independence by the end of the 1820s greatly dissipated. And uh, one American diplomat wrote uh, from Buenos Aires that, uh, you know, if, if any of the enthusiasts for free and Republican principles in South America should witness the executions he had seen there, they would, uh, they would change their mind about the ability of the South Americans to achieve that. In any case, Adams, while he sympathized with such movements, was, uh, was extremely reluctant to see the involvement of the United States in their cause. He thought that only the interest of the United States would justify the use of force. And he also felt that a departure from principles of neutrality and non-intervention would ultimately prejudice the cohesion of the American Union. And uh, the Union was at this time for Adams a, uh, a cardinal uh, value uh, whose preservation he considered to be of the utmost importance. And so this, this context of the period also informed one of the other things that Adams is best known for, which was that he was the central figure within the cabinet in advocating what would become known as the Monroe Doctrine after the, the president he served who proclaimed it. Uh, and you tie this in your book to his support for independence. Uh, but I think for a lot of people today, if you hear the word Monroe Doctrine, it conveys almost the opposite, you know, the idea uh, of the United States dominating Latin America, determining who governs Latin American uh, countries, et cetera. What, what was Adams, uh, what was going on there with, with Adams and the Monroe Doctrine? Well, you're quite right about the, uh, the reputation of the Monroe Doctrine and anything that's lasted, uh, you know, over a hundred years, um, uh, approaching 200 years, because the Monroe Doctrine does occasionally get invoked today, um, uh, usually undergoes very profound shifts in meaning over time. And certainly that is the case with respect to the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, under the influence of James Polk in the 1840s, who justified the Mexican War with reference to the Monroe Doctrine, and then even more at the turn of the 20th century under the tutelage of Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, the Monroe Doctrine did indeed acquire the, uh, the meaning that the United States, and in particular, the president of the United States, might intervene at will in the affairs of the, of the governments of Latin America. And in the course of the first three decades of the 20th century, the Monroe Doctrine uh, was often invoked, and uh, there was a score of interventions in the little republics of Central America and the Caribbean, carried on under its auspices. But at the same time, uh, you know, that idea of the Monroe Doctrine was really directly antithetical to the notion that uh, Adams had put forth. I mean, the central principle of the Monroe Doctrine was the principle of national independence. And Adams also said, even at the time in 1824, when he was queried on the point by various ministers from the South American republics, that it did not entail a positive commitment by the United States to intervene. Uh, you know, South America is a pretty big place and uh, no one really in the United States considered intervention in, the, uh, in Brazil or uh, in Chile or Argentina, uh, the main focus was uh, the status of Cuba. And Cuba was important strategically because it controlled the outlet to the Mississippi River down which so, many, uh, so much American produce passed. Uh, but Adams was not in favor of the annexation of Cuba. He wanted to preserve the existing state of things. And he wanted to avoid a war with either Britain or the Holy Alliance uh, in, in asserting the Monroe Doctrine. His basic idea in, in relations with the, the, the South American republics was that they be founded on the principles of equal reciprocity uh, and uh, independence, a, a mutual advantage. 
And uh, he didn't entertain the ideas of the kind of domineering uh, role that would subsequently uh, be fairly or not attached to the idea of the Monroe Doctrine in subsequent American history. This was actually pointed out in a famous memo written in, I think, the uh, late 1920s by a State Department official who, uh, who pointed to the dramatic contrast between the sorts of claims that the United States began to assert in the 20th century with the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine in particular, and what it, what, what it represented at the very outset. Yeah, that's the Clark Memorandum you're referring to. Yeah, the Clark to Memorandum. There. Thank you. For yeah, I think it was 1928. Uh -huh. uh, so, that's a really so, a very impressive piece of work. You've hinted, you've hinted at this um, uh, earlier in, in your talk, but how did Adams' views on slavery shape his foreign policy thinking? Well, the, the question of slavery was of consuming uh, interest, uh, perplexity, agony, really, for John Quincy Adams. And uh, at the, in order to understand his thought on that question, we have to go back and think about the role that the preservation of the Union played in his foreign policy outlook. He once said that uh, attachment to the principles of neutrality, non-intervention, were absolutely indispensable to the preservation of the Union. He felt that foreign war would inevitably cause a rift within the Union. And uh, that was an ever-present danger because American expansion in one direction or the other would inevitably have effects on the sectional balance of power. So Adams, like the framers of the government, uh, uh, Hamilton and uh, James Madison feared that in the absence of union, a state system would develop in North America very similar to that which had developed in Europe. And the consequence of Europe's state system and its interminable wars was the development of a set of institutions that were antithetical to Republican government. So that meant powerful executive branch, taxes, debts, conscription, all of which uh, struck Adams, as well as the framers of the Constitution, as, as profoundly threatening to Republican government. So that idea that the Constitution represented the, uh, you know, the, the, the greatest achievement of political man yet in world history uh, was central to Adams' outlook, and he uh, he develops in many letters throughout his life uh, the importance of preserving it. The great break comes with the Missouri crisis of 1820. Adams ex had accepted the professions of, of Thomas Jefferson that slavery was an evil and a curse, and that it would ultimately be abolished and emancipation would be brought about under the influence of the principles of the American Revolution. Uh, yes, the Constitution recognized slavery, but as it looked to the future, uh, the Southern leaders especially, as well as the leaders of the North, believed that slavery had to be abolished at some point. Now, the Missouri crisis in 1820 was a kind of uh, riveting awakening uh, by John Quincy Adams, where he realized that the Southerners, far from pursuing the abolition of slavery, were interested in its expansion. And Adams saw the expansion of slavery as a, uh, as a grotesque uh, departure from the purposes of the American Revolution. And a, a denial of the professions that had been made uh, by Southern leaders at the time the Constitution was adopted. So at that point, the question of the expansion of slavery uh, has a kind of electric effect on Adams' outlook. And um, it helps explain his subsequent opposition to both the removal of the Southeastern Indians in the 1830s, as well as his opposition to the annexation of Texas into the Mexican War, both of which he saw as an attempt by Southern leaders to uh, 
to expand slavery. Um, so that bore very directly upon expansion and whether expansion would take place. Uh, Adams is, uh, is known as the greatest of American expansionists in some ways because he set forth doctrines in the 1810s particularly that looked toward the, uh, uh, the expansion of the United States to the West Coast. He presided as Secretary of State with the adams onis Treaty of 1819 in a territorial settlement that uh, included the recognition or the transfer to the United States of the Spanish claim to the Oregon country, although it did at the, t at the same time give up Texas. And uh, so Adams is, is typically regarded as, you know, a man who was uh, dead set on expansion. But in fact, I think if one looks closely at his record, his commitment to expansion was always conditioned by his commitment to liberty, and he would never have accepted the annexation of Texas had Texas been brought in as it was in 1845 with a slaveholding constitution. So uh, expansion was desirable, but it had to be the expansion in his view of the empire of liberty and not the empire of slavery. And expansion also had to be looked upon skeptically if it threatened the dissolution of the union. So related to this, you suggest that political courage uh, is, is a really central feature of John Quincy Adams' character. How so? Well, <laughs> Adams is just about the most courageous figure that I've ever come across in my historical studies. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There were many instances in his life where he uh, uh, basically struck out on an entirely independent course and did things that uh, people considered absolutely fatal to his political prospects. Uh, one great instance of this was that a senator from Massachusetts in 1808, he supported Jefferson's embargo. Now, Jefferson in 1808 was a greatly reviled figure in New England. And for John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams, the Federalist, to, uh, to support Jefferson's embargo was considered absolute heresy by the Massachusetts Federalists who had supported his uh, nomination to the Senate in 1803. They forced Adams' resignation in 1808 because of his stance over the embargo. But Adams said uh, at the time, uh, rather than regretting his actions, I would do them over again were they now to be done at the hazard of 10 times as much slander, unpopularity, and displacement. Well, that was actually something of a forecast of the future because when Adams was in the House of Representatives, he uh, fought bravely for the elimination of the so-called gag rule on petitions of slavery for the end of slavery in the District of Columbia, then under federal jurisdiction. And uh, Adams suffered a tremendous amount of criticism for that. One of his constituents, here I'd like to quote again, wrote that amid insults, abuse, and obloquy, the fiercest fury of the Southern invective in the wildest of the storm, breasting the mad lashings of the waves, Adams stood undaunted and secured the removal of the gag rule in 1844. That was a tremendously courageous thing for him to do. As I say, he stood virtually alone with no allies and braved uh, the slings and arrows of the most withering criticism from Southern leaders. Yet he stuck at it and did so, you know, with a kind of admirable coolness on the, house, the floor of the House of Representatives. So those are just two instances of Adams' uh, courage. He had you know, a unique relationship with his constituents. Um, um, they loved him and uh, supported him, but they were among the few who did. And uh, he, he suffered tremendously for, that, uh, for his brave stance. As I say, it's very difficult to think of anyone else in American political history that uh, uh, that displayed such incredible courage at various moments of his career. 
And I believe he was uh, censured by the House for violating uh, the gag rule in the course of uh, in the course of debate. Um, yeah, well, you know, occasionally people would say that he should be hung. I mean, you know, the proposals too. were made at various points to that effect when he opposed the uh, annexation of Texas in a public letter of, of, of 1843 and held that the annexation of Texas would be identical to the dissolution of the Union. Uh, the House of Representatives brimmed with speakers who said that his uh, neck got to be, you know, <laughs> dealt wow. with in a certain fashion. Well, uh, you mentioned ha happily he survived that, though. Yes, you mentioned Abraham Lincoln and William Seward as as heirs or standard bearers for uh, JQA's thought after his uh, after his passing. I'm, I'm curious if you could say a little bit more about that. Yes, well, that is one of the fascinating things about Adams. As I say, he he begins his career at the knee of his father and of uh, other Federalists uh, concerned with the uh, bringing about the American Revolution and then the formation of the Constitution. But he casts this extremely long shadow because all of the stances that Adam, Adams takes in the 1830s and 1840s very much prefigure uh, Lincoln's political career. I mean, Adams is stout in opposition to the expansion of slavery. That too is Lincoln's issue in the 1850s. Uh, uh, Adams had ascribed uh, the great cause of the sectional conflict between North and South to the South's abandonment of its previous acknowledgement that slavery was an evil and a curse. And that was exactly Lincoln's view. Uh, you know, that's what Lincoln, uh, that was the factor to which Lincoln ascribed the uh, uh, the great sectional controversy that came to boil in the 1850s. There are other aspects of the Adams program as president, his embrace of the protective tariff, for example, and his support for internal improvements that were also central to Lincoln's political creed. But the most intriguing uh, comparison is Adams doctrine stated first in a speech in the House of Representatives in 1836 that in wartime, Congress would have the power to abolish slavery. Now, he acknowledged in the states where it existed, he acknowledged that Congress did not enjoy that power in peace times, but he made a very ingenious argument to the effect that in war, Congress would have the power because to deny that to Congress would in effect to be denied that, that it had the power to make peace. And uh, in a later speech, he extended that power of emancipation to the executive. Well, when Lincoln was elected in 1860 and people were getting, beginning to confront the prospect of a civil war, People in Congress do it, drew attention to Adams' historic speeches on the question. And that was, in fact, the course that Lincoln followed during the Civil War, uh, announcing emancipation in the first instance as a war measure of the government and something justified by the war powers of the government. So, in, in all of those respects, uh, Lincoln was very much a, uh, a, an enthusiast of Adams and a follower of, of ideas that Adams had first enunciated. So you, you conclude your book by drawing themes from Adams's thought and also from some other early American foreign policy figures. And you said that this boils down to a core, what you call a political catechism. So what is that? What does it say? What's the what's that core of our our foreign policy thought? Well, the uh, I try to explore this in relationship to six themes or six ideas concerning power, law, independence, peace, liberty, and union. And I have a series of essays at the end of the book in which I discuss each one of those themes. Uh, the basic summary of the catechism uh, is as follows, that as a condition of ordered liberty, power must be subject to restraint in its exercise, and any condition of unbounded power is an evil in itself. Law is the vital method 
for the use and constraint of power and observing the law of nature and of nations is the best policy. National independence for us and for others is the key building block of a peaceful international order as it is founded on the equality of nations and creates the basis for reciprocity and mutual advantage among disparate peoples. Independence can only be achieved through union, that is through international association and respect for law, and both together promote a state of peace, the fundamental formula for the success of liberty. Now, I think that catechism obviously can be elaborated and extended, but that does get to the gist of the public philosophy that America's first and second founders embraced. And uh, I think that it holds some very profound lessons for the conduct of the United States today in the world. Let's take the first of those doctrines about power, that unbounded power is an evil uh, unto itself. Uh, that idea is repeated by many of America's distinguished uh, 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 statesmen in the early period. Uh, Hamilton, Jefferson uh, can all be quoted to this effect. Um, John Adams, John Quincy Adams' father, once said that jealousies and rivalries have been my theme and checks and balances is their antidote. Till I'm ashamed to repeat the words. And uh, they had a living and breathing demonstration of this in the example of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Adams was minister to St. Petersburg uh, in 1812, a uh, sometime companion of the Tsar when Napoleon invaded Russia. And, uh, you know, that was one of the most extraordinary events in world history at the Grand Army of 600,000 men uh, invading Russia and then suffering in the bitter winter of 1812, 1813, uh, the loss of, of basically the entire army, uh, just an enormous, awful carnage. And when that occurred, Adam said, you know, there's nothing like this since the uh, days of Xerxes. And he exclaimed to his diary, um, the crisis is great and awful beyond exa all example. Almighty God grant that it may turn to good, to peace, to the relief of mankind from the dreadful calamities of unbridled ambition. Now, I think it's interesting to think about that not only the statements of John Quincy Adams, but of, other, of others of the founding fathers, that pa unbounded power is a dangerous thing in relationship to the strategic doctrine of the United States over the last 20 years. For what have we heard from our leaders? That uh, American military superiority is the objective that we should attain to, that we want a condition of military superiority that is, that would be so great that no other nation would challenge it, as George Bush, Bush said in his second inaugural. And I think that on the face of it, uh, if confronted with such statements, the, the founders would immediately raise the objection that <laughs> no, this, that kind of condition of power is obviously subject to abuse. It needs checks and balances, and that those must be found somewhere. Now we can argue today about where they ought to be found, but that they need to be there, I think is the kind of first principle of the political science of the, uh, of the founding generation and one that John Quincy Adams very much shared. Uh, you know, back in the 90s, uh, American pundits uh, were saying all the time that not since Rome as uh, one state so dominated over the international system. And, uh, but for the founders, you know, the whole Roman experience uh, showed the perils of that kind of condition of unbounded power. <clears throat> it showed that uh, Roman expansion was a threat to the independence of nations. Uh, and so they rejected that completely and utterly as an example that the United States should follow. Uh, that doctrine, of with regard to the need for checks and balances on power, obviously entered into the federal constitution. It was kind of part of the warp and woof of the institutional structure that the founders created. Uh, it was central to the lodging of the war power in Congress uh, by the framers of the constitution. 
And uh, it's, it's doctrine that Americans, unfortunately, have allowed themselves to forget. Uh, you know, we're number one sounds awfully good or has sounded awfully good to the American public. Uh, but there are dangers associated with that condition. And the last 30 years of American intervention, I think, bear out the degree to which uh, it, sub it has subjected the nation to temptations that have, uh, that have proved to be folly and uh, that have injured the nation rather than strengthened it. So one of the themes that I, I found interesting that you focused on in this, uh, this last section of your book was law. What did that mean for Adams? Uh, the idea of, uh, of international law, what we now know as international law, was called back then the law of nature and of nations. And um, it's one of the uh, remarkable things about our current intellectual dispensation that uh, the, the, what that was has been uh, forgotten. It wasn't natural law as it was conceived by uh, Catholic uh, theologians, for example, or, or even by uh, Roman statesmen such as Cicero. It was based very much on rational calculation, that is, on the idea that people and states had to treat one another in relationship to the golden rule that, you know, do not that to another, which thou wouldst not have done to thyself. So every nation had a right to national independence. It had a right to use force uh, to protect its just claims, but it also had an obligation to respect the rights of others. Uh, you know, you were to do all the good you could to others, but without injury to your own interest. So this was an architecture of thought that was very widely shared by the founding generation and by John Quincy Adams. And uh, I think an important feature to recognize in, in assessing that is that it was actually rooted in a, in a kind of prudence. That is, it, it, the, the strictures of the law reflected the lessons of experience that were embodied in basic maxims. And we can see the, uh, the force of that in, in the contemporary legal order, which under the United Nations Charter basically reincorporates central propositions of what in the 18th and 19th century was called the law of nature and of nations. Uh, preventive war is illegal under the United Nations Charter. Well, uh, when we say to ourselves, uh, uh, well, why should we respect that rule? Some people might say, well, it's just a piece of parchment. It's just a, uh, you know, a norm that can easily be disregarded if we find it in our interest to do so. But for someone like John Quincy Adams, as for other believers in the law of nature and and nations, it also reflected the lessons of experience. That is, it reflected the notion that if you do injuries to others, they will have an interest and incentive to commit injuries to you. And uh, therefore, staying within the confines of justice, not undertaking wars unjustly, uh, was a lesson for you know, one's own preservation, just as much as it was respect for. Uh, a legal principle. So that uh, that idea of the law of nature and of nations that uh, you know was was very important to Adam's uh, generation, and uh, I think we've really lost a sense of that. And uh, one of the things that counseled was that nations not only had a right to preserve their own interest but they also had duties to be restrained in their conduct of foreign policy and to act in such a way as not to infringe upon the rights of others. And uh, as I say, I think that that's a vital principle that uh, we would do well to respect today. I've got a question from Elliot who asks, how do Adam's foreign policy ideas compare with Jefferson's? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a tough one. I think they're broadly uh, broadly similar. Uh, 
the uh, Adams was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a supporter of the Republican administration of uh, of Thomas Jefferson and its uh, most uh, problematic act, the embargo of 1808. Uh, he's appointed as minister uh, to uh, Russia by James Madison, Jefferson's successor. Uh, he becomes Secretary of State under James Monroe, the third of the Virginia dynasty. And so there's a basic fundamental concordance between Jefferson's foreign policy and uh, that's which Adams adopted. Um, he was much more critical of Alexander Hamilton, Jefferson's great adversary. Uh, you know, in the in the late 1790s, Hamilton broke from the presidency of John Adams over John Adams' uh, peace initiative that he undertook in early 1799 toward France. And uh, Adams had a very acerbic view of Hamilton's motives in that regard, thinking that he wanted the creation of a 50,000 man army and that he was uh, dead set on cooperating with the Venezuelan Francisco Miranda and uh, the British government in a wild scheme to use the British Navy and American land forces to liberate South America. Adams was horrified by that, John Quincy, as well as his father, John Adams, but it was hugely significant in leading to the split within the federal party uh, that in effect delivered the election to Jefferson in, in 1800. But on the fundamentals, uh, uh, Adams was very much uh, in line with the, the Jeffersonian consensus in, in foreign policy. And you know, after the wars of the French Revolution and Napoleon, which split the two parties very deeply with the Jeffersonians being more anti-British and the, the Hamiltonian Federalists being anti-French, each accusing the other of being you know, pro-British and pro-French. Uh, the, uh, those issues with once peace was accomplished in 1815 receded in importance, the kind of controversies on the high seas that had brought the United States into antagonism with Great Britain uh, were no longer present. Britain had no need to impress American seamen, for example, uh, as they had done in the struggle against Napoleon. So, uh, yes, Adams. Uh, Adams was a. Uh, I think in some ways he's he's best seen as a kind of legatee of both sides in the party dispute, and he says this in his first inaugural that he learned from both sides. But in his larger political career, he was more Jeffersonian than Hamilton. Another question from Matthew. In your view, are there any statesmen who have carried on the tradition of John Quincy Adams' foreign policy? How about Ron Ball? <laughs> I think, you know, one goes back to Bush's Iraq War. It was Ron Paul who was really stating uh, kind of those classic principles more emphatically than anyone else. And uh, I don't subscribe to all of Paul's views on public affairs, but on the uh, on that central principle of the uh, of of whether the United States should go to war to ex extend democracy, uh, which proved to be such a catastrophe in Iraq. Uh, it was Ron Paul at the beginning of that crusade who was most stout against it. Um, uh, now, there's a handful of people today that can be associated with some of those principles. Um, I think Tulsi Gabbard would probably uh, subscribe to uh, much of what Adams had to say in, uh, in his famous 1821 speech. But by and large, uh, both the Republican and the Democratic parties have acclimated themselves to a, a very large military establishment. Uh, standing alliances across the globe uh, and to a set of policies which are in direct contradiction 
to that which John Quincy Adams recommended. Got a question from Sean who asks, how do you think John Quincy Adams would approach our foreign policy problem with a rising and increasingly aggressive Chinese Communist Party that will likely invade Taiwan within this decade while it still has the capacity to do so? Adams wrote a, a remarkable pamphlet in 1841 on, on China. And uh, he was a uh, he was a great critic of the existing Chinese government uh, of, of his day. Uh, you know, the Chinese in the early 19th century in their approach to the European powers adopted an attitude of uh, superiority towards uh, all the uh, barbarians on the outside and foreign emissaries were obliged to do the kowtow, which meant tapping their forehead nine times on the floor before a meeting with his imperial majesty. Adams found that to be totally insufferable, uh, this attitude of superiority towards others. And he recommended that US-China relations be based upon principles of equality and reciprocity instead. Now, I think in some ways Adams misjudged the, uh, what was going on in the war between Britain and China from 1839 and 1842. He didn't think it was about opium, but it proved to be about opium in large measure. And in effect, the policies of the European powers uh, you know, reversed the kowtow. And instead of China imposing it on the Europeans, the Europeans, in effect, imposed it upon China with the creation of extraterritorial zones along the Chinese coast and various other indignities which China came to associate with the century of humiliation. Today, I think it's a remarkable feature of the situation that both China and the United States charges the other with an attitude of superiority degrading to itself. And it seems to me that the uh, the kind of prescription that Adams gave to that state of affairs, trying to found that relationship on the basis of equality and reciprocity is the right one. Now, what he would have thought with regard to the U.S. commitment to Taiwan, we can only infer. I mean, after all, uh, he died in 1848, and he stated principles that argue against the United States adopting the self-defense or the defense of Taiwan into its security structure. He says very clearly in his 1821 address that we should resort to war for no causes uh, other than our own. And so I would count him a, a skeptic with regard to that particular policy prescription and trying to find a path forward for U.S.-China relations that would respect China's right to develop, uh, uh, but also safeguard American interests. Uh, you know, how he would come down on the particulars of the management of that relationship, though we, we can only make inferences, not, uh, not firm predictions. Sure, you because know, I could also see you know, he, his whole principle uh, in uh, in the Monroe Doctrine was, well, de the government de facto is the government de jure for us. Uh, you know, and there there is de, there are two de facto governments uh, of China uh, as well. Um, yeah. So pivoting uh, to a question from Matthew, who asks uh, regarding U.S. global military presence, would JQA have a different opinion of global naval bases versus global army bases? You know, I think maybe just for a little bit of context there for some of our listeners, you know, the U.S. Navy has had a global presence much longer uh, than the United States Army has. Uh, you know, and maybe it might make sense to work in here a bit about Adams's views of, uh, of international commerce uh, as well and free, uh, free shipping, which was a, a big uh, theme for him. Yeah, those are a complicated set of issues uh, involving questions that have, you know, dissipated and are very different from those today in which it's difficult to kind of recapture. I mean, for example, the impressment issue. 
um, that was so important to uh, U.S. British relations. Yes, well, I think, he, like his father, he was friendly to American naval power. Uh, although Adams does say late in life that uh, he saw in the conquest of Mexico a series of developments that uh, from which he drew back in horror. Uh, uh, you know, that the United States would become a colonizing nation with bases all over the world uh, and have an aggressive policy. And so, you know, if you look at the development of naval power in subsequent years under the auspices, say, of Alfred Thayer Mahan, you know, I think Mahan had a conception of Amer American naval power that the United States, by virtue of commanding the seas, would be able to exploit that advantage which doesn't really kind of express Adams' view. I think he would probably be friendly to the idea of the United States as a naval power uh, uh, participating in the uh, use of the seas by all nations on the basis of equality and, uh, and reciprocity. And, uh, but uh, I've, would be reluctant to say that he would go the full course and argue for the kind of pretensions that the United States has adopted with regard to its Navy in, for example, the Western Pacific. I mean, those, those are associated with very advanced doctrines of American interest, and in particular focused on the Taiwan, on, on, on preserving the independence of Taiwan and being willing to go to war on behalf of Taiwanese independence that uh, are contradicted by Adams' uh, doctrinal statements with regard to when the use of force is justified by the United States. So one of the other questions you reckon with in, at the end of your work is whether Adams should be understood as a realist. What do you make of that? Well, yes, in, in certain respects, I think probably I would characterize him as a liberal realist. Uh, as someone who can't really be captured by uh, the, the, the ideas that are associated today with realism or liberalism. But the law of nature and of nations, in, in effect, incorporates both of those strands. And for someone like Adams, it was axiomatic that the security, prosperity, and liberty of American citizens was the foremost duty of American political leaders. And insofar as realism is to be understood as embracing uh, that proposition, yes, he's a realist. But he also believed that the pursuit of the national interest had to be circumscribed by the uh, recognition of, of norms that were obligatory on republics as well as kings. Uh, that had to be rooted in justice. Uh, he accepted the uh, admonition of George Washington in the farewell address that this nation was to observe justice and good faith with all nations, uh, seeking peace with all. Uh, and so that that combination is uh, is difficult to find today. Uh, in some respects, but I think that it was the the way in which Adams incorporated themes that we might recognize as belonging either to realism or to liberalism that is the most distinctive characteristic of his approach. So, you know, and that shouldn't be all that difficult to, to understand. I mean, that, that a nation should take care of the liberty, security, and prosperity of its own citizens. Uh, uh, that its first responsibility is to look after its own hearth uh, is perfectly compatible with the idea that it should not go around injuring the rights of others, just as an individual uh, can improve uh, himself or herself without engaging in a career of robbing banks. <laughs> you can do that in legitimate ways. Uh, and avoid illegitimate ways of increasing your good fortune in the world. And as for individuals, so too with states and nations. And that was very much Adam's, uh, Adam's viewpoint. Now, 
I should add parenthetically that the idea of liberalism that uh, is present prevalent today is you know very different from the sorts of ideas that were associated with the liberal ethos back in the 19th century because back in the 19th century you know liberalism was very much associated with the right of national independence and with the right of nations to find their own way and didn't assume that any nation had a right to uh, force others to the adoption of what they acknowledge to exist as universal human rights. That was up to them. They had to find their own way to freedom. And uh, uh, whereas the contemporary version of liberalism really is a kind of one fits, one size fits all view that in effect denies that the nations deemed enemies by the United States, even sometimes the nations deemed friends by the United States, have any rights at all. And Adams uh, totally rejected that proposition. So one of the other uh, debates that has emerged uh, in discussing Adam's legacy is there, you know, there's, there's kind of a revisionist current out there about Adams's foreign policy views in things like uh, Robert Kagan's book, Dangerous Nation, or you mentioned uh, John Lewis Gaddis's 2004 book, Security, Surprise, and the American Experience, that you know sort of suggest Adams is a bit of a forerunner to modern uh, neoconservatives. You know that he he was an advocate of a world transforming, preemptive, and forceful foreign policy that sees American power as essential to the spread of freedom abroad. What do you make of that view? I think it's totally wrong. <laughs> well, you can go back and look. I mean, the way that Gaddis puts together his argument is really suspect. He relies basically on one episode in which Adams justified the movement by Andrew Jackson across the into Florida uh, after uh, there had been serious incursions from, from Florida into the United States. And um, that's a complicated episode that we can't quite get into, but the larger tenor of Adams' policy is absolutely clear that he was against preemption. He wanted to preserve the peace. Uh, he, that was his overriding preoccupation as president, and that's illustrated in innumerable uh, episodes. You know, he, he, in discussing the question of potential war with the Holy Alliance with uh, his Secretary of State, Henry Clay, he, he says, uh, um, or I guess this was when Clay was uh, the Speaker of the House in 1821, the same year as the uh, uh, as his 4th of July address, he says we should go to the wall uh, before using force, make every attempt to put the other side in the wrong. You know, and he recognized that if the Holy Alliance were angling for uh, uh, a war with the United States, the United States would have no choice but to meet it. But we were to meet it, not to make it. That is, uh, he stated a principle there that was diametrically opposed to the doctrines of preemption and preventive war that uh, prevailed under the first uh, under the George W Bush administration. We've got a question from Jeff who asks should the United States maintain the goal of preventing the emergence of regional hegemons in Eurasia uh, and maybe to to tie Adams in a little more tightly with that uh, you know what? What do you think he thought he would have thought about that as kind of an ethos for our foreign policy? And yeah, you know, maybe do you think the the rise of Napoleon uh, during his time as a diplomat, you know, who under the continental system had a lot of power in Europe, uh, is an example of of hegemony and how Adams might have reacted to it? Well, as I say, I think that the uh, uh, if one takes at face value, the strictures that Adams uh, laid down for the conduct of American policy, the answer would be no, he would not uh, support the use of American force to prevent the emergence of uh, regional hegemons uh, throughout the world. 
I mean, that in effect is a formula for uh, endless war. It's a formula for the kind of military establishments that we've maintained. Now, having said that, uh, a lot's happened since he lived. Uh, the material existence of the nations has, has undergone great changes uh, with the rise of trade, of, of the energy revolution, and a whole series of developments. So we can only speculate as to what that would uh, entail for, uh, for an Adams, and how he would have registered those developments. I say at the end of the book that one of the striking things that one learns going through life is that People who revere the same figures and look up to uh, great figures in the past, like a Hamilton or a Jefferson or a John Quincy Adams, uh, frequently don't agree on the policy questions that uh, uh, we confront today. And that's just, we can't really invoke these people uh, with 100% certainty that the, the, they would agree with us on those policy questions. But I still think that we can learn from them. And I think that a figure like Adams really does kind of provide a set of strictures that afford us a path out of doom, a way of approaching the problems of foreign policy that is modest, uh, that's ethical, that's attentive to the interests of the United States, and that would succeed in uh, avoiding a great power war, which we are on the cusp of today. All right. Well, we've been speaking with the society's president, Dr. David Hendrickson, about his new book, Freedom, Independence, Peace, John Quincy Adams and American Foreign Policy, which is available online at Barnes & Noble from today uh, and is also available as a digital edition for free on the Society's website. Thank you, Dr. Hendrickson. Thank you to everybody for attending.